everybody. I welcome everybody to the ISSI Game Changer Seminar Series. Um, the Game Changer Seminar Series was a reaction of ISSI to the COVID situation. Today, we are in the 30 something uh, in, uh, talk of that uh, series addressing themes and topics of, uh, that are covered by the, by the program of ISSI. Um, today's talk is about the sun and next week's talk will be coming back to earth. Weather disasters in changing climate that by Stephen Belke, that will be next week talks. And in three weeks from now, we will have another solar talk, almost 50 years of coronal heating by Joan Schmelz. But uh, coming back to today, I'm very proud to announce Sarbani Basu as our speaker today. Sarbani uh, has studied in India with a bachelor from Chennai, a master from Pune, and a PhD from the Tata Institute in Mumbai. Uh, she then moved around the world in th to uh, had three postdoc positions. First one at Queen Mary and Westfield in London, then at the Theoretical Astrophysics Center in Aarhus, Denmark, and the third one at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. In the year 2000, she joined Yale as an assistant professor and moved up the entire ladder, became the chair of the Department of Astronomy in Yale in 2016, the position Sarbani holds uh, today. Sarbani has received numerous honors and awards, the most important of which 2018, the George Ellery Hale Prize of the Solar Physics Division of the American Astronomical Society. Uh, her research field, as uh, clear from uh, the title of this talk, is the sun, and specifically the helioseismology, the helioseismic study of the structure and dynamics of the sun, you're also using the sun as a lab to test physics in the sun, and in particular that applies to the abundances of elements inside the sun, the composition of the sun. Um, the title of the talk has a question mark in it. Do we know what the sun is made of? I'm eager at the end of this talk to know whether we do know the answer or not. It's a real puzzle of the solar composition is a real puzzle. And I'm very happy that you, Sarbani, are one of the astronomers who doesn't think the world is made of hydrogen and 10% of helium, but knows that all the, all the rest is very important, the composition of the sun. And uh, I'm very eager to listen to your talk, Sarbani, the floor, or rather the screen, is, is all yours. Please, Sarbani. Thank you, Rudy. And it is indeed a great pleasure and honor to be giving this talk. What you see on the screen is a solar spectrum. And it's all this forest of lines which we are bothered about. This is the signature of the elements that concern us. So very roughly, the sun was born with about 27% by mass of helium. 0.2% give or take is the mass of metals. And I speak of metals as an astrophysicist, meaning metals is everything helium, heavier than helium. And hence that is what is the metallicity of the sun or any other star. And when we say there is an issue of so of solar abundances, it is that the current mass fraction Z over X at the surface of the sun, which is the only, only place we can measure abundances of stars because we can't really directly measure abundances inside a star. It's Z over X that is in question. What is Z over X? Okay. Why do we care? Well, it is the sun, we need to 
care about that. But it really affects how the sun evolves and how long it'll live. And to put it on a bigger astrophysical context, it is the standard against which we measure the composition of stars. We always talk of composition relative to solar. And if we don't know what the solar is, that inherently gives uncertainties in any other, uh, any other measurement or estimate that we make. So what happens? Okay, now let's try and look at what a solar model will do on the HR diagram, its evolutionary track. Now, solar models are not constructed in exactly the same way as we construct the model of any other star, because just because you have a one solar mass model doesn't mean it's the model of the sun. Because for the sun, we have very important constraints. We know the radius of the sun at its current age, which we know. We know the luminosity of the sun or temperature, if you wish, at the current age. And any model that we claim to be the model of the sun must be a one solar mass model that satisfies these two conditions, as well as the metallicity at the surface. And we do the luminosity and radius by changing the mixing length parameter, which models convection, and the helium abundance, which controls luminosity. And so this figure on the left shows basically three tracks of different values of z over x. And you can see that they, of course, have to intersect at the current solar uh, properties, and then they diverge. And if we look at how long they live on the main sequence these models. What I've just done is plotted the central hydrogen abundance as a function of age. You see that the higher metallicity star will evolve off the main sequence faster than the lower metallicity star. But this is modeling the sun. What are the implications for other stars? Uh, with other stars, for most stars, we don't know the radius. We just know the luminosity and we have measurements of temperature. So we use the more or less the solar value of convection, that's the convention, and use that to make a model. So for a one solar mass star, one solar mass model of different metallicities, a low metallicity star given by this dashed blue line will be hotter, more luminous, and it'll live a much shorter lifetime. So all age estimates of stars, which are inherently model dependent, the only star for which we have independent age is the sun. So all our inferences about stellar evolution, lifetimes of stars, hence, you know, lifetimes of stellar populations depend on knowing what the metallicity scale is. So why how does heavy element affect stellar structure? And it's mainly through radiative opacities. They impede photons from, from being transported from the core where nuclear reactions occur to the surface where they stream off. And the effect of metallicities changes on temperature, temperature and temperature, and it changes the temperature gradient. So it changes energy transport. So metallicity affects where you have a demarcation between radiative and convective zones. And it also changes the structure of the core and hence energy generation. And certain elements, particularly CN and O, affect CNO reactions. The CN in the sun, the CNO reactions are a very small percentage of all the energy that's generated, but it's still, as we'll see, can play a crucial role. Now, this graph shows how different elements contribute at different layers of the sun. This is the logarithmic gradient of their, uh, of how much they contribute to opacity as a function of their abundance. This line is the base of the convection zone. And please make a note of this and 
And what we find here is that the opacities here depend on iron, uh, but the higher dependence is on oxygen. And it also depends on neon. In the solar core, the metal metals don't contribute too much, but nonetheless, they do contribute. And these are the two regions that I'll be talking about mainly. Okay. So how do we determine solar abundances? Now we are lucky, unlike other stars, there are actually three ways you can find the abundance, the uh, metallicity of the sun. You can do it through the spectrum, which is what we do for other stars. And you don't just have to depend on the photospheric spectrum, you can do chromospheric and coronal spectra too, but it's the photosphere that we're worried about. You could look at ancient meteors, which help in refractory elements, but not so much as the volatiles because the volatiles well, by judging by the name, you know we won't see them. Uh, the issue of connecting meteoritic to photospheric abundances is silicon. Meteoritic abundances are always measured as a function of the silicon abundance. So we have to find the photospheric silicon abundance to put every other meteoritic uh, abundance to the photospheric standard. And then you can actually make in situ measurements in solar wind and other look at other energetic particles. Unfortunately, there's a problem called the FIP effect, which is the first ionization potential effect that causes a fractionation between photospheric uh, abundances and abundances in the corona and the solar wind. So it's actually less useful for us. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to concentrate here mainly on spectra because that's what caused the issue. So, I mean, we all know how abundances are measured from spectra. We identify the lines, make sure we know the continuum. We construct a model atmosphere or use other people's model atmospheres. We use the model atmosphere to do a line formation calculation and uh, determine the abundance it used to be through the curve of growth analysis, which some of my uh, extragalactic uh, friends still use, although of course in the stellar field, it's more usually done through spectral synthesis these days. And in principle, it should be an iterative process because of course the model atmosphere depends on the composition and all that stuff, but it's generally not done that way. And the usual assumption is thermal, local thermal equilibrium, but with thanks to computers getting more powerful, non-LTE calculations are getting more common. And we'll see that and they're also a part of the issue why there's a, there's a problem with the solar abundance. And usually 1D photospheric models are used. Now 1D models are static. They don't have dynamical uh, information. So we normally have three parameters, something usually referred to as microturbulence and even macroturbulence, depending on the, uh, the scale of the, of the dynamics. And these are included as three parameters. So if you do that, what is the solar abundance? And I'm more interested in Z over X rather than the relative abundance of each element. That matters, but that's a second order effect in most cases. So the most commonly used solar abundance is the third one here. And I showed these three because uh, <clears throat> Nicola Graves has done a lot of work in this field and he's followed this throughout. He's a very respected person in this field. And his latest, I mean, this was, this is the one, the last 0 0.023 is what most solar models have been using. And actually some of them still use. Now, the thing is all these three are, were determined from very similar analysis techniques, 1D, LTE, the differences were, in model atmospheres, the atomic data used, the spectra, and also what sort of meteoritic abundances were used for the heavy elements. And then things changed. We were sitting pretty, and then things changed. 
In the early 2000s, a group led by Martin Asplund started using 3D model atmospheres, which were a result of simulations of convection in the outer layers of the sun. And they also used non-LTE effects. And what they found is they basically lowered the solar abundances. Now, 3D FITs are supposed to be more reliable because they are more realistic. So this, for example, is a snapshot of the temperature from a convection simulation. Uh, temperature as a function of depth. And because convection is a dynamic process, turbulent, it's not that there is one temperature at any given depth. The temperature fluctuates. And also, because of the dynamic effects, the line profiles give a much better fit, as is shown in this figure. The data are in black under the pink points. The pink points are the 3D fit, and the green curve is the 1D fit. So far, so good. So what happened? The abundance estimate went down. So in the early 2000s, it was said that the OK, Z over X was 0 0.0165, which is really low. It was later increased, and there's a recent preprint, which has increased it even further. But the reason this matters is that the lowered abundances changes the structure of solar models, and they no longer agree with the structure of the sun. So how do we even find out what the internal structure of the sun is? And this is where we turn to helioseismology. Given that helioseismology is not a very common field, I'll give a crash course in helioseismology first. So the sun and stars like the sun, any star which has an outer convection zone, oscillates. These are stochastically excited oscillations. In the case of the sun, we've seen many, 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 many modes. These oscillations are low amplitude oscillations, unlike the oscillations of classical pulsators. So they're basically linear. For example, in the case of the sun, the velocity amplitudes for any mode would be a few centimeters per second, while the velocity scale that we compare it with is the speed of sound, which even at the surface is of the order of 10 kilometers per second. To a large extent, they're adiabatic. It does break down very close to the surface, but we know how it affects the mode, so we can correct for it. For the sun, uh, all the observed modes, well, that's a provocative statement, but all the observed modes that I believe in are basically acoustic modes, meaning sound waves, so what we call P modes, P per pressure, or surface modes, which we call F modes, which are basically the simple surface waves, which we see on the surface of an ocean or a lake or something like that. And each mode is characterized by three numbers. There's N, which is the radial order, which is the number of nodes inside the star. L is the degree, which is the number of nodal circles on the circumference. M is the azimuthal order. You, it's a spherical harmonic, basically, the angular term. So M is the azimuthal order, which you could think of as the number of nodes along the equator. And the fact that I've talked about equator, you can imagine, you can see that if the sun was spherical symmetric and did not rotate so that we couldn't define an equator, all modes with the same L and N, L and M, but different M, would have the same frequency. So Ms don't matter when it comes to a spherically symmetric system. Rotation will lift this degeneracy. And so the plus M and minus M frequencies differ and depend on the rotation rate. Now, given that in the sun, we can observe very, very high degree or high L modes, it's very difficult to characterize the frequencies of every M component. Think of an L of 200 mode you're going to have 400, 401 components. It gets pretty noisy. You won't be able to observe too many of them. Instead, in this field, it's conventional to express the 
frequency of a given n for with a given n, l, and m as a central frequency that only depends on n and l and an expansion in polynomials that depend on m. Now, this has a nice effect. The central frequency only depends on the spherically symmetric structure. The odd order coefficients depend on rotation. The even order coefficients depend on the second order effects of rotation, magnetic fields, and any other asphericity that you can think of. And asphericity in the sun is small. And we know that because the second order A coefficients are tiny compared to the, uh, sorry, the even order A coefficients are tiny compared to the odd order ones. I just care about new NL. And at least for this talk, it's the central frequency that matters. What do the data look like oh, before that? Now, to use helioseismology, what we do is we don't compare the frequencies because it turns out our models don't reproduce the solar surface very well. And also this thing about non-adiabaticity close to the surface. That means comparing frequencies gives you lots of uncertainties. Instead, we invert the frequencies to find the internal structure. And the relationship between the structure and frequencies is actually fairly simple. So you have the frequency that this is the displacement eigenfunction, rho is the density, so the frequencies depend on the density. C squared, C is the speed of sound, not light, sorry, that's the helioseismologist notation. C is sound. So the frequencies basically depend on sound speed and density because pressure is of course related to density through hydrostatic equilibrium. Acceleration due to gravity is also related to density. Chandrasekhar showed that this is actually a emission eigenvalue problem. So we can linearize this problem around a known model because face it, we can determine omega, we want to determine rho and c squared, but there's no way to figure out what the uh, displacement eigenfunction is inside the sun. So we linearize this problem around a known solar model, use the variational principle, and we can write the relative frequency difference between the sun and a model in terms of known functions of the model and the relative difference in the squared sound speed and the relative difference in the density and a term which accounts for the fact that these boundary conditions are not always the same, et cetera. And this is only a function of frequency. We call it the surface term. Can we, oh, the data. So this is a typical data set. You have the spherical harmonic L, frequency N, lots of modes. The reason this method is so powerful is this. These are 5,000 sigma error bars. So we know the frequencies with amazing precision. And we can do inversions. And this is just a test inversion to show you we can invert. This solid line is the exact difference between two models. And the triangles are the inverted differences. OK. So what do we see? This is the relative sound speed difference between two solar models and the sun, and this is density difference. These are two published models, which is why I showed them here. And what you need to remember here is look at the scale. So this is the relative difference in the squared sound speed here is about 0.8% which means the relative difference in sound speed, it's fairly linear, right? So it's about 0.4%. Even density differences are only of the order of 2%. So for most astrophysicists, we, should, we should have said we have a perfect model. Let's forget about it, except that we do have differences. And this difference here is basically because we don't have, most solar models don't have mixing below the convection zone. Now, these models were constructed with Z over X of 0 0.023. What happens if we use the lower abundances? So these are not the same models, the red model, what I'd shown, because I needed to construct models with everything else the same except the abundances. 
And you can see the moment you have lower abundances, the discrepancy at the, this is the base of the convection zone becomes much larger. That's not the only difference. So the sound speed difference get worse. And this jump is mainly because the base of the convection zone for a low metallicity model is much, much shallower than what it is in the sun. This is the solar value. That's for the higher metallicity model in this figure, and that's for the lower metallicity model. And you can see we are many, many, many sigma away. The other thing is the surface helium abundance is also lower for the low metallicity model. We know from helioseismic data what the surface helium abundance is for the sun. And the low metallicity model does not um, match that either. But that's not the end of the story because they're a different group, use different 3D model atmospheres and slightly different non-LTE effects and different lines to find a somewhat higher value of Z over X. And if I use that value of Z over X, so this was Elizabeth Akapal and her collaborators. If I do that, I get a model which is mm, relatively good. So this is what I mean by the puzzle of the solar composition, because these are also 3D model atmospheres and also non-LTE effects. So what is the difference between the three groups? If you're interested, it's I'm just showing CNO and FE because these are the ones that really cause most, most of the difference, particularly remember the opacity graph. Well, wow. now for the convection zone base, the main issue is opacity. And you can actually increase the opacity to get a match. So, uh, just after the first Asplund et al. abundances came in, which were fairly low, I, I mean, lower than the 0 0.0165, we went about, no, it was 0 0.0165, trying to see what would be the change in opacity required to get the correct structure. And what we did there is we made models of the solar envelope. Now, the nice thing about making an envelope model is because you don't have to necessarily uh, match the central boundary conditions exactly, you can make models where the base of the convection zone matches exactly. So in other words, you have the exact sound speed difference between the sun and the model at the close to the base of the convection zone. But what happens is, density doesn't match. So this is the difference in density between the model and the sun, okay? For different models constructed with different values of Z over X. So what we did, we took the Z over X and we changed it, sorry, we took the Z over X and we tuned the opacities at the base of the convection zone till the density difference became a zero at the base of the convection zone. And this is the curve we got. So this is for opal opacities. OP will give slightly different values. This cross is at one for the opacity and the Griffiths and Sauval, the higher metallicity models. This is for the then lower metallicity models. The current Asplund et al. Opacity, uh, model, it, it, abundance is somewhere here. So it'll require a slightly lower change than this implied. Um, we weren't the only pe people to think of that. For example, Josefina Montalban, she changed both the opacities, as you can see from this graph, and she changed the rate of diffusion because helium and heavy elements settle down under gravity. So if you locally increase the metallicity at the base of the convection zone, you increase the opacity so you get the convection zone back, base back to normal. But the problem with doing that is if you increase the diffusion rate, you decrease the amount of helium at the surface even more. There's a problem there. Then others tried accretion of low metallicity gas 
or started with a higher mass star, so this is Joyce Guzik, or added more overshoot, but nothing really solves the problem. Yes, you can tune parameters, but that is inherently unsatisfying and doesn't tell you what exactly is happening. Yes, you get a perfect solar model, but what have you learned about stellar astrophysics there? Particularly since tuning, you can do different types of tuning and get back to the same model. So there have been efforts to measure opacities and in the Sandia lab. The first experiment was a few years ago where they just tried metal and they looked at transmission spectra naturally at conditions for the, uh, by conditions, I mean, temperature and electron density conditions at the base of the solar convection zone. And the results were concerning. Black is the data, the blue and the other colored bars in the first uh, two panels are the calculations by different groups that calculate opacities. This is the ratio. And you can already see that the calculations have a lower continuum. It's actually a quasi-continuum. They have narrower lines and they have a deeper opacity window. So in other words, these experiments say that opacity should be higher. So if you convert, th this is just for iron, if you convert this into a Rosalind mean opacity, the Rosalind mean opacity just due to iron alone would be more than 40% over what it is now. But of course, iron is just a tiny fraction of all the opacity. I should say tiny. It's a fraction of all the opacities. So the total increase may not be quite there. This experiment was repeated because no one could quite understand this quasi-continuum difference. So at conditions at the base of the convection zone, iron is basically has lost every electron except electrons in the lowest two orbitals. So it's like a neon atom, except for one missing electron. Chromium and the quasi-continuum issue was believed to be because of this hole in the L shell here. So they said, okay, let's do chromium and also nickel. Nickel is exactly like iron in those conditions. Chromium has three holes. So you would expect chromium to have the highest discrepancy, nickel to have no discrepancy, and iron to have, be somewhere in between. What do you see? I look at the lower panel first. No, chromium and nickel are fine. It's iron, which is a problem. So we don't know what's going on. Uh, the lines are generally thinner in the calculations, except there is one calculation where if you put in instrumental broadening effects that seems to agree with at least the broadest lines, but this is still a problem. So even opacity measurements are not quite there. Now, people fixate on the base of the convection zone because that's the biggest signature. However, the upper convection zone does not depend on opacity, but on the equation of state. And there, if we look at the effect of metallicity on the adiabatic index. You can, in the inversion process, remove things like the effect of helium and uh, pressure, et cetera, and go down to the intrinsic gamma one, which is only caused by the equation of state and the metal and metallicity. The low metallicity and high metallicity models differ. The high metallicity models are in red, Low metallicity models are in blue. Generally, there is a one high metallicity model in black. The solid red and blue, uh, blue lines are for the opal equation of state. Now, opal equation of state has a fixed mixture. You can change Z over X, but you can't change the relative mixtures of the different elements. So. The question then is, does the relative difference matter? And for that, we have to use a different equation of state, which is the CEFF equation of state, where we can actually change the mixture. And the biggest difference is Z over X. There is a small difference due to the mixture, but this is 
the difference of the adiabatic index compared to the sun. And as you can see, the low metal models, low metallicity models have a larger difference. So low, met low metallicity models, so just changing the opacity may not change. Of course, this particular result has been disputed, but before I go there, we actually tried to use the signature in the convection zone to see if we can find Z. We did not do an inversion, but instead we looked at the, uh, the dimensionless sound speed gradient, which in a model looks like this. This peak is the helium, second helium ionization zone. These tiny dips are the metal um, ionization zones. And again, the high metallicity and low metallicity are different. We've shown a model with opal equation of state in blue. We don't use that because opal, you have to interpolate in tables and the results of the interpolation are clearly seen in this figure. So even though this is an inversion. Now we do that. So we find this quantity for the sun, which are these uh, blue and light blue and green points from many, many models. And what we do then is we, for different models, we compared them with the sun. What we did was we integrated the signature over a radius range. That's the sun, this quantity. These are for different models with different metallicities. And you could sort of read out what the metallicity should be. Okay. Now, these results, as I said, was disputed. So Sergei Voronsov et al. and Gael Bulgin tried to do inversions for metallicity, and they said they favor a lower metallicity, uh, a lower metallicity for the sun. Now, at least the later paper, Kyle's paper, which is actually a nice painstaking work, except they do say that when they try to invert using a low metallicity reference model, they can't get a stable solution. To me, that's a hallmark of that the, the inversion is not quite there yet. It's a very difficult inversion to do. So I'm not surprised that it's difficult. So I'm still waiting to see if we have higher degree modes of this inversion can be stabilized, but we don't have too many sets of higher degree modes. So we can also look at the stellar core, okay? Um, but so what we can do is make frequency combinations that are actually sensitive to the sound speed gradient. And uh, higher metallicity models have a higher sound speed gradient than a lower metallicity model. Sure enough, that is what happens. Except, I'm going to skip this. Even in the core, ion opacity matters. So it's not, if the core were at a slightly higher, solar core were at a slightly higher temperature than it is, maybe things would have been fine because this is the fraction of opacity due to various things in the core and electron scattering and free free are relatively easy to calculate relatively, but there's a lot of bound free and bound bound, meaning line formation and ionization uh, opacity for iron. So unfortunately that is again, opacity. So what can we look at? Let's look at neutrinos. So there are the PP neutrinos, which people have been looking at for a while now. And if you look at the ratio of say the boron and the um, beryllium, the ratio of observed to expected, one is where you would want your model to be. GS 98 and AGS is 09, which is the lower. So high blue and higher metallicity, red and lower metallicity, sorry, it's a, different convention than the ones I had earlier. Um, you would say that this point is closer to the high metallicity one. Now, the width of these ellipses actually can be reduced by marginalizing over all the other uncertainties that we have. For example, even the 
low metallicity tables or the high metallicity tables, every uh, metal abundance comes with an associated uncertainty. The luminosity has an uncertainty. The solar age has an uncertainty. We think we, ha we know how to handle the uncertainty and the opacity. Well, it's roughly 10% or that's a sort of standard value, but maybe more as we saw from this anti experiments. If we do that, then these, if we marginalize over all of those, then the ellipses get squashed and they lie on this line, which is simply temperature. And you can increase the temperature by changing the opacities. So PP neutrinos do not work. Now, but we do have at least one to 2% of solar energy coming from CNL neutrinos. And that can be much more helpful because the ratio of CNL neutrinos to PV neutrinos depends on the metallicity. Baroxino recently, the Baroxino collaboration recently reported data taken over 10 years. And this just shows, this particular figure shows all the contributions at different energies. This is the one which sort of summarizes it. So the gray band here gives you the plus or minus one sigma result from Borexina. The pink one is plus or minus one sigma from high metallicity models and the blue one from low metallicity models. It's only, we're only talking about two sigma effect right now. So, but maybe more statistics would help because if we look at this, a naive, some, a pro, a naive thing to say, or a simple thing to say would be that the solar, metallic, the solar core metallicity is even higher than our normal, high metallicity models, what's in normal high metallicity models. Now, there are clearly problems in spectroscopic analyses, and there's a considerable amount of work that is going on to see what is, what are the different effects, and also, you know, different ways of trying to find metallicity. So there was a recent paper where this group, uh, Cubas Armas et al, looked at resolved spectra from the sun, spatially resolved spectra from the sun. They looked at an iron line and did an analysis, which I'm told is actually reasonably model dependent. And they actually find differences in between granules and intergranular rains, which worries me a bit. So it must be extremely temperature sensitive and maybe even sensitive to the magnetic fields. But if they find an average for the surface of the sun, they get a very high uh, estimate. By very high, I mean as high as the, almost as high as the so-called high metallicity models, which is this. Uh, incidentally, this is a unit of log number of the metal, number density of the metal divided by number density of hydrogen plus 12. So now there's been a very painstaking study by Bergman et al, and I've only seen the preprint at the moment, who, has, who have looked at different oxygen lines and looked at all the systematic effects, like using, you know, different non-LTE effects and different lines and different model atmospheres. And the results are really scary because they can get equally likely values, very different equally likely values from different lines. In other words, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in the spectroscopy front. And so I would definitely say that the solar abundance issue is still alive and well. Yes, you can tune a lot of parameters to get your model to match the sun, but I don't think tuning parameters helps us figure out what is going on inside the sun. So after the notice of this uh, today's seminar went out, I was sent a preprint by uh, Kunitomo and Gio, who had who used 
high metallicity accretion during the formation of the sun from pebbles in the protos protosolar disk. But to get the core metallicity right, but then they still had to have uh, high, tune the opacities at the base of the convection zone to get the to keep the surface opacity, sorry, the surface metallicity in line with the lower metallicity estimates. So it's not quite there yet. Okay. So I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts. So just what I said, the solar heavy, heavy element abundance, unfortunately, is still quite uncertain. And it's, I think it's the uncertainties and systematic effects that spectroscopic determinations have. I mean, which is ironic, spectroscopy made astronomy, converted astronomy into astrophysics. It's allowed us to do so much, but now we are looking into the effects that are hampering our progress. Uh, neutrinos from PP reactions do not necessarily distinguish between high and low Z uh, models because, again, capacity uncertainties can be an issue there. CNO neutrinos hint at a high D solution, high Z solution, but we need to collect more statistics. So thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. Excellent. Thank you, Sarbani, for this very inspiring and, and complete talk. And I'm very happy to know that the problem is still with us. I think that's the, the bottom line. So I'm sure there must be tons of questions. Uh, now we have a, an uh, audience that peaked almost near 200. Very nice audience, by the way. Uh, now the audience has two channels to uh, ask questions. Um, first, and I see some have already started doing that, uh, you can uh, put your questions in the chat and I will read them to Sarbani. Uh, you don't need to monitor the chat, I will read them to you. And uh, that's the one channel. The other channel is you can raise your hand if you like to ask a question verbally. And uh, then I will um, ask Billy to open the microphone for you and you can place your question in the chat. When putting your questions in the chat, uh, be aware that um, by default, they only go to the panelists, but you can change that uh, near the bottom of the chat. You can change that, that the questions are will be seen by the panelists and the attendees uh, if, if you prefer whichever way is more comfortable. So let me start with the first question uh, by William Wall um, about astroseismological models. Do, astros do astroseismological models from observations of other stars provide any insight into the discrepancy between the structure and abundances for the sun? Very good question. and. My opinion right now is no, because most of the modeling for other stars is very conventional modeling, meaning we make models and then we try to match our models with the frequencies of the other stars. Mm -hmm. And so you could actually have two different classes of models. You could make models with the with a solar metallicity scale that is high and make models with a solar metallicity scale that is low. And it's not completely clear yet that we can actually distinguish them. Uh, there has been some work early in the days with some of the, um, I think they were beat cepheids, which are kappa mechanism oscillators, if I remember correctly. So there was, there was some, at least one paper there which said that for beat cepheids, the lower metallicity scale seemed to uh, give the excitation better than the higher metallicity scale. But it's it's tough with us. With seismology doesn't directly probe metallicity, which is the problem. If it did, we wouldn't be here today. 
it's always through the equation of state and the opacity or something like that, yes. Yeah, a very similar qu uh, question by Paula Joffrey. I just read it, but I think it's basically the same. This is very interesting. Thank you so much. By the way, many write that and uh, I would like to underline. Uh, is there any other star we can investigate the tension between spectroscopy and inner properties now that we have asteroid seismology? I think that's basically that. Yeah, uh, offhand, I, I, yeah, offhand, I don't know, but I know that, for example, a former student of mine who's now a postdoc in Aarhus is actually figuring out how to do inversions for other stars. And maybe that'll give us a hint, but again, it'll be a hint modulo opacities. Yeah. Right, same problem. And, yeah, it's the same problem. Yes. Uh, there is a question by an Alison, uh, unnamed Alison. Um, she says, uh, probably stupid question. I don't think it's a stupid question at all, but here it goes. As the sun evolves, it is producing metals in the core. Is this excess metallicity taken into account in the models of the core? The core of Z will be higher. Uh, the sun, fusion in the sun doesn't produce metals. However, the fact that metals settle down under gravity does change the metallicity of the core. So yes, there is going to be a change in the core. So high metallicity, the models that start out with high metallicity still have a higher metallicity in the core. And so for example, in this plot where we are looking at signatures from the core, I didn't explain this. I, I thought we should have more time for questions. This Z is the Z from the core, for example. So. So yes, it is higher, but it, we do take that into account. But again, that is not something, that is something we can only infer from our models. That if you start off with this, you'll end up with that. Yeah. Right, right. Gravitational settling from the convective zone into the core. Into zone. the radiative zone. And the yes. other thing is, let me, uh, my understanding from a long time ago, the uh, solar astrophysics uh, lecture was that, uh, yes, in the core, helium is fused into, into carbon, but mm. that part is not, con not making it up into the convective zone. It remains locked in, in the core. Uh, the current sun doesn't have helium fusion. Uh, so, I'm it sorry. Uh, no. The CNO makes a little bit contribution there. Yeah, that's not going to end up at the surface anyway, not yeah. right now. So, yeah. That's what I meant. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Not helium fusion. It's not that red giant yet. Yeah, fortunately, yeah. for <laughs> fortunately for us, indeed. Right. Let me continue with uh, um, Glenis Farrar. Magnetic field is asking, magnetic fields can in principle be important. Is there an argument that they can be ignored? It seems that it is not included in the modeling. It's a very good question. And depending on your inclination, you can answer that either way. Mm -hmm. We don't know what core magnetic fields are like. However, if we look at helioseismic data, the signatures of magnetic field are small. Uh, particularly at the base of the convection zone, it's uh, less than a mega gauss. It's, I think the upper limit still stands at 0 0.3 mega gauss or something like that. And the, so the magnetic pressure is not high enough to affect structure, in other words, because if it were, we'd see it in the frequencies. Uh, well, we don't know in the core. I mean, there's so few modes that actually sample the core. Maybe there's something, but yeah. It took uh, two decades to find the G modes, which and reached which... down into the core and these. Are... <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure I completely believe in those G modes. Okay, <laughs> let's not open this box. Yeah, let's. That's a completely different. <laughs> that's a talk by itself. Right, right. A good hint. Yes, yes. I will remember that. Okay. Next question is by uh, Julia Delzana. Hi, Julia. Um, he has a comment rather. 
Uh, there, there are also measurements of the quiet sun transition region and corona not affected by FIP effects to be considered, as well as in situ measurements of the fast solar wind. Uh, thanks for asking this question. That's my uh, field. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Um, but uh, the, the elements we would love to measure from the corona and the solar wind are the noble gases. Neon, because that contributes a lot to the um, a lot to the opacities, and there's a question about the FIP effect of that. that the coronal abundance of neon is not necessarily the same as the photospheric abundance. But that was the issue there. Yes, this is very much correct, and that was actually the question I wanted to bring up. Yes, neon is uh, something you can't see because it doesn't have lines. At, photos at photospheric temperatures, but uh, we can count uh, neon uh, particles one by one with the mass spectrometers in C2. So yes. we have a very good handle at it, but yes, there's the- How do we convert that to, I mean, if neon is indeed affected by the FIP effect, yeah. how do we convert that to the photospheric one? And that's the issue and that'll give you the uncertainties. There are limits on that. Uh, so yeah. you can use it as an estimate, uh, but, um, the effect of, um, so let me ask my own question here uh, because it relates to neon. The helium abundance mm -hmm. you can infer from his helio seismology data because helium Indeed. is, is, is uh, abundant enough. Yes, I will tell you exactly how, even though I don't have it in this one. Please one please. of the ways we did that is, I showed you this figure of the um, dimensionless sound speed. You see this peak up here. Right. The height of this peak depends on the helium abundance. So one of the first estimates that we did, we basically made a lot of models with different helium abundances and looked at how this height compares with the observations. Yeah. However, there is an equation of state effect. So one has to be careful about that. Okay. And I think that's the answer to my uh, follow-up question. Any chance of uh, using helioseismology for any other element rather than helium? Um, it is tough because you can see the signatures yeah, these ripples, here. Yes. These ripples. And the thing is, what we found when we were looking at because there was a suggestion that the neon abundance in the Asplen et al. Ta et al tables should be increased and then yep. you've solved the problems. But depending on how the other elements behave and which, which mixture you use, changing the neon abundance will solve the problem here at the base of the convection zone, will make the problem bigger yes. here. Yes. So it yes. doesn't completely do it. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Thanks. Let's continue with uh, Sergei Kopeikin's question. Um, when you say 3D modeling, do you mean that the rotation of the sun is included that takes into account the solar oblateness? No, I just mean 3D models of solar convection. So you do convection in a box. Yeah. Solar rotation in Euclid is in a box, right? Yes, so that you can do a full compressible simulation because compression, being able to do a compressible simulation is important here. So you have these simulations, make, they, they were started to study solar convection, but then it was realized you could use the same things to do a line formation analysis, so why not do it? And in the case of the sun, the oblateness is tiny. It's a few parts in 10 to the six. I forget the current limit because the sun is a very slow rotator. Yes. So for when it comes to structure, at least, yeah, we normally ignore it though. You can get rid of uh, some of the discrepancy, you know, the sharp discrepancy at the base of the convection zone by adding some rotationally induced mixing, but yeah. Okay. Uh, now I see that the hour is up, but we have uh, three or a few more questions in the chat. If you allow, we will continue a little bit more. Yeah, surely. Um, 
Richard Marchand has a question and or a comment rather. He says that this, uh, I mean, theme of your talk, this looks like an inverse ill post problem. To what extent do we know that with observations available and possible observations in the future, a unique or at least a set of close solutions can be found? Uh, I am not sure if I understand the question. Solar structure inversions are pretty well determined by now. We can use different methods, different data sets, mm. different inversion parameters, you'll get the same thing. Mm. Uh, some of the secondary inversions like metallicity, et cetera, that require you know, assumptions, those are far more difficult. And there, I think the question is still open. But yes, this may be an inverse problem, which in principle is ill-posed, but we get rid of some of the effects by putting in physical constraints. For example, sound speed is always positive. Density is always positive. Yeah. Uh, just putting in physic extra physical constraints allow you to actually determine the uh, structure very well. And even dynamics for that matter, we know it's the solar internal dynamics pretty well too. Okay. Uh, by the way, I still don't see any raised hands. It's possible to raise- I actually see, you. I actually see a couple of raised hands. Oh, that's a shame because uh, I thought yeah. they would flow to the top. Uh, they uh, are at the top. There is William Wall, somebody called Ayuk, and then Jan Christensen Dalsgaard. So let's uh, let's take uh, Chris, um, uh, Christens and Dalsgaard's uh, question first. Uh, Vili, if you would like uh, to open Jürgen's microphone. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Shabani, for this excellent overview of, uh, of your work on, on the solar abundances, which, of course, is still a very open question. I just really wanted to remind uh, all of us that in the 90s, there was a very successful uh, workshop at ISI on the solar abundances. Uh, that might even be before your time. I can't remember whether you were there. No, I wasn't there. I was there in the next one. Ah, yeah. It's this book. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's right. I certainly recommend that. Uh, and, and then I wonder if, if you would just comment a little bit more about the uncertainty coming from the uncertainty in the equation of states for the determinations of the abundances, both helium and, and heavy element abundances. Helium uncertainty is actually for the equation of state, if we take the two current, I've done OPAL versus MHD, haven't done CEFF, I must say. There, the, the, it's, it, you can take care of that by just increasing the error bar. Let me see, I forget how much it is. Let me go back to the table. I'm sorry. Okay. So this 0034, if you increase this to about 001, okay. you would take care of MHD versus OPAL. Right. So. And then there's also the, the Russian Saha equation of state, which of course. Yeah, I've never. I, yeah. But, yeah, I've not really used that. And one no. of the things I want to try and do is implement this so called free equation of state. Uh, the Natal. But, yeah, uh, true, yes, that's right. So, uh, so I, I haven't quite looked at that, but right. it, it's not, I would be surprised if things change too much. Right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jürgen. Thanks, Sarvani. Uh, frankly, I can't see the raised hands. So, Vili, can you tell me what whose uh, hand is also still raised? William Wall. Okay, let's that let's take that question next, please. Hello, okay, William. Am I coming through? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah. So I enjoyed your talk. It's a it's a fascinating um, conundrum here. Um, so um, it's easy to believe that you have uh, 3D non LTE modeling of stellar atmospheres is relatively new. So you're going to expect discrepancies and results from different groups. 
But I'm wondering, to some level, don't you have anything like that with uh, helio seismology? Uh, is are the systematics um, character characterized sufficiently well that you don't have uh, large discrepancies there too? Sometimes. Uh, not really. I did some work in the early 2000s where I took very, very different reference models because the question with structure inversions in helioseismology is uh, that the very different data sets, of course, which do show slight differences, but that's because they don't have the same mode coverage all the time. And I took very different reference models with different types of physics. And yes, the diagram, like the sound spit difference between those models and the sun is of course going to be different. But if I then back calculate what the sound speed for the sun is, there were the error bars actually showed that pretty well. There could be systematic effects very close to the core. There could be systematic effects very close to the surface. The biggest systematic effect comes from the resolution. How well can you resolve the structure? So for example, at the base of the convection zone, if you really want to pinpoint where the base of the convection zone is, so this number on the screen, you cannot do it through conventional inversions because inversions won't allow you that resolution. So yes, there's systematic effects. We think we know how to deal with that, at least for the usual inversions for sound speed and density. I don't think we've quite got a handle yet when it comes to inversions like metallicity, direct inversions for metallicity. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So let's continue with a few more from the, uh, questions from the chat. A very brief one, and uh, probably also with a brief answer by Charles Horowitz is, uh, can, dark can dark matter particles transporting energy influence the problem? Dark matter particles. So there actually has been a few, uh, some work on this where you assume at least the one I remember being uh, a part of, which was a while ago now, had axions in the core, which would stream out. And you can actually put limits on that because we know the structure. The thing is, we know the structure of the sun and dark matter particles affect the core, not so much the other parts of the sun. So if you're trying to solve the metallicity problem with the dark matter, issue that doesn't quite work out mm -hmm. there's actually one more raised hand Rudy. okay let's take that thank you who is it really please speak up low iq i uh, can you hear me yes. yes okay i still follow up with the magnetic field uh you, i i remember your answer is something uh helioseismology a present field of a uh, megaparsec, uh, uh, no, sorry, mega gauss, 10 to the six gauss, less than that? At the base of the convection zone. At the base, okay. So suppose you have a global sort of a buried magnetic field. Could that uh, allowable because you could have an effective uh, magnetosonic speed, sort of a faster sound speed. And then if you change the structure somewhat and allow the magnetic field, would that be still possible to fit with the helioseismology data? Hmm, I do not know. Okay. I, because I can't really think how that's going to work. As you mentioned, the 10 to the 6 scouts, less than that. That's uh, people conceive a kind of a mediated random magnetic field inside the sun. No, that's a sort of, no, the 10 to the 6 is a sort of toroidal field at the base of the convection zone. And the okay. reason I was looking and everybody else before me were looking at the toroidal field is that's what's supposed to then give rise to the solar dynamo. Okay. So there was a reason to look at the base of the convection zone. Right. So in a sense, uh, we conceive something here, there, uh, the base of the convection we zone. Can, the we can... We can put limits because we can barely see. Okay. If they're indirect limits, we can only see 
we can see magnetic field effects up to the, the so-called near surface shear layer of the sun. So uh, uh, a former grad student of mine found things around 0.96 solar radii okay. as well in the near surface shear layer. But again, the signature in terms of helioseismic splittings is so small that okay. at least, yeah, we don't see a direct I was thinking, suppose we have a layer of a relatively strong, whatever uh, magnetic field. It's uh, when you put in the seismology, you consider that layer with a sort of an effectively higher sound speed because you have a magnetosonic speed. That means the sort of a sound speed square plus uh, alpha speed square square root of that whole thing. And then you, you just consider that particular region with higher effective sound speed. And then you adjust the other parts of the structure, and then you can still sort of a fit with the helio seismology data. Would that be possible? Or I'm just wondering. See, so what you are basically saying is you have a model with a magnetic field, you're calculating frequencies, but the frequencies have another component. Right. But right. if you give me those frequencies or you do it yourself, you can then again check against the sun how well uh -huh. it does. Uh-huh. Because we know the structure of the sun, that's the thing. Uh huh. We, or we know the density. Well, and, in yeah. a sense, we know the structure from the inverse problem, right? We yes. have the data, we have the yeah. uh, model, mm -hmm. and then we try to fit with the data in a sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay, let's uh, continue. Thank you for this question. Let's continue with the chat. There are a few more there. Uh, Diego uh, Capello, uh, thanks you for a very, very complete talk one of the most intriguing issues in astrophysics. That's, uh, yeah, that's a big word. Question, would neutrinos from the CNO cycle be the best probe to solve the abundance discrepancy since they're not affected by opacities? Is it a matter of obtaining better statistics? For the core metallicity, yes, better statistics would solve the issue. Okay. But Salt then yeah. there are all the other issues. How do you connect the core metallicity to the surface? Mm -hmm. Yes, if you have a high surface metallicity, it, it, you know, you take a conventional model, it'll be a core, a high Z core. But uh, you could imagine all sorts of other things happening. So who knows? <laughs> So if it comes to figuring out what the surface metallicity of the sun is, I think the only way we can do it, what we can say is certainly with the current standard models, you cannot have the low metallicity models do not match the sun. If you really want to know what the surface metallicity is, I think we need to rely on spectroscopists getting there. Uh, the systematic errors, right? So I was talking about this preprint by Maria Bergamon et al. Sorry. I know I have it somewhere. I have a figure. Ah, this one. So this is a figure in her preprint. She takes two lines, different model atmospheres, different LTE effects, etc. And this is the abundance that you get out of the same line. That's what I mean, that yes, we still need to understand the spectroscopy and how to get the abundances out of it. Yeah. Whether 1D or 3D, I think. Whether 1D or 3D, yeah. because clearly 3D, or, well, 3D is slightly more consistent, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember when 3D came up, everybody thought, now that's the truth. Yeah, the but truth. yeah, till Elizabeth Akafawatal showed. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. it's spectroscopy all over again. Right. Next question is by Tristan Guillo. Hi, Tristan. Uh, he says also it's a very nice presentation. Actually, we, that is he with uh, Masanobu Kunimoto, find that modern muscle modern models using low atmospheric abundances match seismology constraints with only a minus uh, about 12 percent increase of iron opacities on the high end but similar to the z pinch experiment results by bailey et al 
the match is actually better than when using high atmospheric abundances. That's a remark from Tristan. Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, better meaning high atmospheric abundances and a high opacity? Or, yeah, because that will be, if you use a high atmospheric abundance and you make the opacities higher, you can make the opacity slightly higher and get a better match. But yeah, but, but yeah, 12% is what I would have said because this is, oh, let me get out of this. Going back to the first work we did. So yes, 12% is somewhere here, uh, it's here. So yeah, I can see a 12%. And these are opal opacities. Most people use OP. So if you increase that, you, yeah, I can see that happening. Okay. Uh, next, as a non-expert, Mike Erasellos asks, he, I am wondering what types of models of the solar interior are used in such exercises, 1D models or, uh, or, or um, uh, more dimensional? No, these models are all 1D for the models. solar interior. These are all 1D models, standard, oh. normal, stellar models, except that model, these are models of the sun, meaning they have been tuned to have the correct luminosity and radius at the solar age. Okay. I am not aware currently of any 2D model or even definite 2D model that can be which has high enough resolution. I mean, I know people are modeling it, doing models, mainly to study dynamics, but generally what is done because 2D evolution would take forever is you evolve the sun to the current age and then add the second dimension and relax it and add any rotation or any other effect that you want to, or you put in rotation effects in 1D as is done in the Geneva code or something like that. So so-called 1.5D modeling. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the question is, could that contribute to the discrepancy? I would be surprised. Yeah. yeah. Because Adding rotation at the base, rotational mixing at the base of the convection zone makes the high metallicity models agree much better. So you see this big bump here. That is because when you have diffusion of helium and heavy elements, they sort of gather at the base of the convection zone. So in our models, the sound speed is much lower than the sun. In the case of the sun, there is evidence that the metallicity gradient at the base of the convection zone is much smoother than what you have in models. Mm -hmm. So if you take a model, add rotational mixing, which was done, I mean, I think 1996, Olivier Richard and company did that, you can get rid of this finger here that, or at least make that much smaller. Okay. But, the difference between this and the low metallicity model is this is more like a very localized difference. Where this is this difference affects most of the radiative zone, the one for the low metallicity models. Okay. Okay. In the meantime, Tristan came back with uh, addition. Sorry, I meant the twelve percent increase of Rossland opacities. Mm -hmm. due to higher iron. Yeah. Okay. That's just a context to his yeah. previous question. Mm -hmm. There are three more, if you uh, allow me. Sure. Uh, any raised hands? I can't see them. I'm sorry. No, I don't see any raised okay. hands. So yeah. the three yeah. last questions are Juan Manuel Fernandez. Uh, he's a, probably a naive question. Uh, may not be. As far as I know, the solar models you are talking about. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, these and are one models. Not... However, yeah. as you said, Osplund Z over X determinations are based on 3D atmospheric models. 
is this an incoherence and is it important? I think we talked about that. So it yeah, be... so no, so the Afrozad models are tiny boxes at the yeah. top yeah. of the sun. So, so the 1D yeah. models are of the entire body. Yes, yeah. yeah. Uh, Natalia Zambrano Prado, she says, great talk. Thank you so much, Sarbani. Do measurements of the material in comets or asteroids, thinking of Hayabusa 2 and so on, get considered to look at the abundances in the sun. Sorry if you already talked about that. I think in the very beginning you had this. Uh, yeah, so result. normally meteoritic abundances are considered sort of undisturbed from the primal abundances. I don't know about comets hmm. because I would imagine the surface of the comets may not be completely undisturbed. I mean, they're volatile elements, so it's an issue with comets even of the, sorry, with meteors, even if the outer layers are melted, you can hopefully find, you generally find pristine material inside. The best ones are the carbonaceous chondrites, which, yes. uh, which there was a recent fall of a, of a new carbonaceous chondrite. So I'm eager to. to yeah, know. that'll be interesting. These are rare, these are rare beasts. Yeah, yeah. yeah the issue there of course is the silicon abundance, because you have to get a photospheric abundance of silicon to convert the meteoritic abundances to the form that we can use in, right. you know, as a fraction of hydrogen. So, yeah. Last question, Markus Schmossmann. That's a very technical one, actually. It maybe leads. It's more of a comment that it's I. It's more get. of a comment. You see yeah. it. Uh, yeah, uh, that the free EOS will get rid of the wiggles. Actually, yes, free EOS, free EOS does get rid of the wiggles. The wiggles are just interpolation. It's the, there's. Uh, no, now I wonder what wiggles are we talking about? I should get back to the figure because. I do not want to give a wrong. The wiggles I'm talking about that depend our interpolation issues are these guys. Right. Yes, these can be easily, if you have an analytic or a semi-analytic equation of state, you can get rid of those, that's not a problem. These wiggles are actual. This is the signature of ionization of the metals. You do not want to get rid of those. Very well. Excellent. Thank you. We are done with the question in the chat. No more raised hands. So all that remains for me to do is thank you very, very strongly again, Sarbani, for this great talk. I learned a lot. We all learned a lot. And uh, let me leave with announcing that uh, the Game Changers seminar is continuing up to the summer break. Uh, next week we have an uh, oh, where is it? We have a talk on Earth science, as I said, weather disasters in a changing climate with Stephen Belcher. Two weeks from now, age and formation of the moon. And three weeks of, from now, please be all back, uh, all of you who are interested in the sun, as uh, John Schmelz is telling us about almost 50 years of coronal heating. And with this, thank you again, Sarbani. Thank you, everybody attending this uh, fascinating talk. And uh, I close the seminar. Have a nice evening, morning, day, whatever, in whatever time zone you are.